Well, good afternoon. As we are in the middle of our second day of Indigenuity 2.0, honoring the lessons of Mother Earth, is the most extraordinary three-day festival with some of the most extraordinary joyful people you'll ever want to meet that are talking about serious, purposeful events in our lives right now from climate change as to right now to the idea of a conversation on food sovereignty. I shall take it away, let you introduce yourselves, who you are, but um, it's our honor every day to expand our museum family and welcome to the family, even though you've been with us for five years. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Dagota, Chi Mark Ford, Gonse. Uh, my name is Mark Ford. I just greeted you in my ancestral Apache language. I am the director of Na Native and Tribal Partnerships at Feeding America. Feeding America is the largest nonprofit organization in this country dedicated to fighting hunger and food insecurity. Um, we uh, support over 200 food banks around the country within our network, along with 60,000 partner agencies, probably some little food pantries or church groups, uh, schools that provide meals for those or food for those who are in need. Uh, I'm honored today to be with you all. We're going to talk about Native American food sovereignty. And this is kind of conversation. Um, so it's uh, very open to anyone who has questions or would like to uh, bring up anything around Native American food sovereignty. I'm honored today to be with Aaron Parker, who is the executive director of the Indigenous uh, Food and Agricultural Initiative based out of the University of Arkansas. Um, Erin's going to share a little bit with us about the work uh, she and her team are doing um, around policies with USDA, with our, uh, with our legislators, um, in looking at agriculture, and with the Farm Bill. So Erin, thank you for being here today. Welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into this work? How did you get involved? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Mark, and thank you, Charlotte, uh, for inviting me, and thank you to everyone who's here in person, and those of you who are joining us virtually. It's really great to be here, um, be involved in the celebration. Um, I am Erin Parker, and I, I, will, I would love to tell you a little bit about my organization, the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. We've been at the University of Arkansas School of Law for 10 years. We turned 10 next year, actually. And we are the only uh, national legal and policy research focused center in the country that focuses on food and agriculture policy research for tribal governments and indigenous food producers. Uh, that is, that's our niche specialty. So I'm an attorney, uh, so I apologize in advance if I say uh, too many jargony or acronym words. Mark, feel free to slap my hand and make me translate. If I do slip into the US acronym soup. I uh, will try not to do that. Um, but what we do at IFAI is we exist to be a free resource for all 574 plus federally recognized tribal governments, 100 plus state recognized tribal governments, and over 80,000 native farmers, ranchers, and food producers all across Indian country uh, in the space of food and agriculture. So that our work is pretty broad. Uh, that's a pretty broad description, and that's true. Uh, we do a lot of policy-focused work, and that's a lot of what we'll be talking about today day in the context of food sovereignty, because for us, we really can't talk about food sovereignty without also talking about tribal sovereignty and the extraordinary power of tribal governments to support the health, safety, and welfare of their citizens uh, through food and agriculture policy development. So that's a little bit of what we do at IFAI. We work with tribal nations on food and ag policy development at the individual tribal level. We also support national uh, agricultural policies in uh, by doing research and policy analysis of federal agricultural policy that affects tribal nations and tribal citizens. Uh, so one of those things is the Farm Bill, and we are the research partner to an organization called the Native Farm Bill Coalition, which is made up of over 270 member tribes uh, all across Indian country that came together to advocate with one voice for Indian country in the 2018 Farm Bill, and we're gearing up for another Farm Bill cycle. So I know we're probably going to get into some of that today too, but that, that's a little bit of what IFAI does. They really do a wonderful job. I'm familiar with Erin um, and the work her team does and been honored to be, to witness some of the great 
research and uh, work they've done around policy. It, Aaron, so you talk about the Farm Bill. A lot of people may not know what the Farm Bill is. Sure. Um, tell us what it is and um, how are tribes involved in that historically or even presently? You mentioned there's 270 that are yeah. involved now. So tell us a little more about the Farm Bill. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so the Farm Bill is a really significant piece of federal legislation. I think perhaps it's the most significant piece of federal legislation when it comes to shaping our food system in this country and agricultural policy. Uh, there's it has provisions and programs and funding support for everything from food security and food assistance to agricultural credit for farmers and ranchers who want to get into farming and ranching or who have been farming and ranching for a long time. It has land stewardship and conservation implications to protect and safeguard natural resources. I mean, almost everything that you can imagine uh, that you would need to do if you are producing food or eating food probably has a provision somewhere in the Farm Bill. So it really impacts impacts everybody. Um, but this legislation has been around for a while. The first Farm Bill was passed in 1934. Um, and historically, Indian country was really left out of Farm Bills. If you go back to those early Farm Bills to 1934, you see barely, if any, mention of indigenous people. And the provisions that are there are certainly not anything that we would call indigenous-led. Um, they are uh, very much uh, including indigenous people as, as an afterthought. Uh, there's some hints to tribal uh, trust responsibility that the federal government owes to tribes, but it's really not anything that uh, has been asked for by tribal nations and is really supporting tribes when it comes to food and agriculture. That really started to change, I would say, about 20 years ago. Um, there's some really great organizations in Indian country, like the Intertribal Agriculture Council, that have been a really strong stalwart voice for Indian country in the Farm Bill for a long time. So when we hit like the, the 90s, we start to see a little bit of change, and we see a little bit more uh, forward-thinking federal legislation that opens up opportunities for tribes. But there wasn't anything really significant until the 2018 Farm Bill, um, which was passed almost five years ago. It'll be five years next year. Um, and in that legislation, we saw 63 tribal-specific pieces, pieces in that legislation that were advocated for by tribal nations. Uh, this is part of the work of the Native Farm Bill Coalition to support the tribes that are advocating for those things. And those are provisions that open up financial opportunities to native food producers and tribally owned farms and to tribal nations that they had historically been shut out of in this huge federal process. So it can be pretty significant for Indian country and it was really exciting to see that change in 2018. That's awesome. Could you share with us a little bit about what is it that the tribes and you as a coalition have um, asked for in this new farm bill that's coming up? What are some changes that support food sovereignty initiatives or access to food or addressing hunger in tribal communities that you all have been working on? Sure. So my organization is the research partner to the coalition. So we do a lot of educational analysis of previous farm bills. We also have been traveling around to Indian country, uh, meeting in community uh, with people, talking to them about what their needs are in the space of food and ag, because we don't want to just make this stuff up, right? It needs to come from Indian country. Uh, it needs to be indigenous informed and led policy. Um, so we've done a lot of research and we've uh, recently released a report called Gaining Ground that looks at over 150 opportunities for Indian country in the next farm bill, which should be next year. They usually happen every five years, but I think, as we probably all know, uh, Congress sometimes does things on their very own timetable. Uh, we do hope we get a farm bill next year. It is supposed to be, but we'll see. So it should be the 2023 farm bill, and I'm going to go with that until someone from Congress tells me they're not going to do it next year. So that's what I'm going to call it. Um, but there are every there's so many different opportunities in the farm bill. I think it's specifically talking about food sovereignty. One of the ones that comes up a lot is more uh, tribal nations' uh, ability to control and run run food assistance programs, for example. Uh, the 2018 Farm Bill made a really cool, uh, innovative, indigenous-led change in that area and actually opened up an opportunity for tribes to do some food procurement directly, uh, to buy food directly for uh, some of the food assistance programs that really support food security in Indian country. Usually it's USDA that makes those decisions about what food uh, goes into those programs. But this kind of opportunity really recognizes tribal sovereignty and it puts 
tribes back in that historical role that tribal governments have always fulfilled um, in being able to make sure that their citizens have good quality food access. Um, so expanding opportunities like that in the 2023 Farm Bill is definitely one of the opportunities that we looked at in the, the report that we just released for the coalition. It's something that we've heard from all across Indian country, from tribal leaders to individual tribal citizens, uh, that this is something that would be incredibly impactful, not just for food security, but also for tribal producers who could sell products to their tribe that are traditional or culturally appropriate, incredibly healthy. Um, so it's an economic development opportunity for them and a food security uh, staple for tribal citizens as well. So things like that are really exciting. That's awesome. Um, thank you for sharing that. You know, you had mentioned that you did a number of tribal listening sessions. So um, you and your team, as well as other members of the Farm Bill uh, Coalition, also went around Indian country listening to people. What were some of the things that stood out to you the most in these listening sessions uh, that people were very passionate about or really concerned about or things that just, maybe something somebody said to you that just has stuck with you? Sure. Um, we've done, I think, over 60 roundtables now, um, and I think just in the last six months. So it's been a lot of travel for our team. If I look a little tired, that's probably why. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's good to be in community, and it's incredibly energizing. Um, but our team, along with uh, folks from National Congress for American Indians, Intertribal Agriculture Council, um, the Shakopee, Midwakan, and Sioux community, who are all the founders of the Farm Bill Coalition, have done so many of these roundtables. And I think, you know, the common thread is certainly um, around access to food that we hear a lot. Um, that there, it's not about quantity of food, it's about quality of food. Um, that food is not just um, something that nourishes physical bodies, but also that it's part of culture and incredibly important to like language revitalization and uh, all of those things that we hear I think very, very commonly. We also hear a lot about barriers uh, in access still, unfortunately, um, to USDA programs. So I think there's still a lot of administrative uh, work that we have to do with uh, the federal government to make sure that native producers have full access to the programs that help farmers and ranchers be successful. Um, but I think, uh, and I think we also hear quite a bit about land stewardship. Um, people are very climate focused. Um, very concerned about the uh, the future of their lands, their waterways, the natural resources that they've lived in relationship with from time immemorial. Um, having the flexibility and the the opportunity through policy to make sure that those resources are safeguarded in a way that respects indigenous principles of science when it comes to natural resources management it was is definitely something we hear a lot. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, one of the things that we know that impacted us as a country is COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, a lot of us heard the stories, and I live in Arizona, so I know personally how some of the tribes were impacted by the rates of infection and the number of people who died, especially our elders and our wisdom keepers. Um, how did the pandemic, Did you, through your listening, uh, roundtables, how did you hear the pandemic has impacted food security um, and those initiatives that were going on in tribal communities? There were definitely deep impacts uh, in Indian country because of COVID-19, and um, that absolutely continues. And the, you know, the loss of knowledge keepers and wisdom keepers and communities and can't be understated. That's huge. And those reverberations will certainly continue um, for generations to come. But for food security, um, I think we're also seeing you know, one of the things at the very beginning of the pandemic, our associate director at IFAI, uh, Carly, said a lot that um, the pandemic didn't break anything in Indian country food systems, uh, but it did show it was already broken. Um, tribal nations have known for hundreds of years that as a result of colonization, removal from lands, uh, from waterways, from traditional foods, that tribal food systems needed restoration from a tribally focused lens um, and not from a colonized lens, right? And so, I mean, that's 
those breakages were already there. Um, I think that the pandemic made them impossible to ignore for anybody outside Indian country. Uh, and I think policymakers did see that. And there was some support in some of the uh, COVID related legislation that actually uh, for the first time in some cases made it very clear that tribes were eligible to run some of the food assistance programs that were being offered as emergency programs. That doesn't always happen in legislation. Sometimes tribes are not included, um, but they did this time. And so despite the fact that we know food security rose significantly in Indian country, disproportionate to any other place um, in, in the country or any other population in our country, uh, we also know that because of tribal governments that they were, uh, they were able to work and deliver deliver food in a way that uh, made sense for their communities and their citizens were turning to their tribal governments as tribal citizens do in times of crisis. Um, so that's, I think, a, another policy lever as we're looking forward to things like the Farm Bill, uh, prioritizing tribal governments, uh, being able to have access to these programs is so critical all the time, but especially when we're in crisis. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that Feeding America, what we learned through the pandemic is that it opened the door for opportunities for our food banks to work more closely with tribes um, to, to meet those needs. Um, you know, for many of us living in urban areas, the store shelves a lot of times were empty. You know, toilet paper disappeared and, and other products were difficult to find. It was even worse in more rural tribal reservations. Um, and so there was a need, and I know a lot of funders came forward. A lot of people wanted to support those initiatives. Um, but also native people discovered for themselves, at least through the people I know, is like, I want to start growing a garden to plant, you know, my own, I'll have food that we're going to can and store and preserve in case this ever happens again. So there was like a determination from people that I felt that were, that was stronger than before yeah. the pandemic. Uh, in the farm bill, um, is there any of those type of initiatives that could be supported to help individuals uh, or smaller communities to to access to grow their own foods. Uh. Sure, I, mean, I, th I think we were seeing this, some of the same thing too, um, just from the work that we do. Although we weren't able to be in community during a lot of the pandemic, you know, we were corresponding with people every day and seeing that determination. Um, and I think you know that determination was there before. It just there was re a lack of resources. And when I talk about that, I mean federal resources. I mean dollars, right? Um, like there is a significant amount of unfunded programming that's supposed to be supporting tribes that. I think we finally saw through a lot of the pandemic relief legislation, tribes were getting access to, to funding to actually invest directly in food systems. So we saw um, just right across the, the border here in Oklahoma, uh, the Muscogee Creek Nation, the Osage Nation stood up their own meat processing facilities, for example, so they can uh, process meat from their uh, tribal producers and be able to offer that then at a lower price point sometimes to their own folks within their community because it doesn't have to travel thousands of miles to get to people. Um, we saw those changes and the farm bill can absolutely be impactful for continuing that trend long term. And not I, I, I mentioned meat processing, but I mean, that could go all the way down to individual community level um, support for more local food uh, and through um, like marketing programs and the horticulture title. There's 12 titles of the Farm Bill. I tried not to get too into the weeds, but I can't help myself. I am who I am. Um, but there's there's a, a, a there's support for um, community gardening. There's support for entrepreneurial efforts in agriculture that can really reach small local producers. Um, what we look at a lot of times in federal legislation for things like that is a uh, tribal set aside in all of those programs, um, that a portion of the funds for all of those different things are actually literally set aside and they are only for tribal governments or tribal producers to be able to access to make up for some of the systemic lack of access that Indian country has seen in those programs. Um, and I think that that's a really effective way to do those kinds of programs and can open up a lot of opportunities potentially um, for exactly what you're talking about um, to keep fueling that effort going forward. And, and I noticed too uh, that a lot of tribes did receive funding through the pandemic in order to bring more like medical support, you know, uh, offer vaccinations sure. and and uh, PPE supplies that were needed. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is that there's money starting to be funneled into tribes to support like internet connection and cell phone service. And 
Um, you know, for Native people, I know my own experience has been that food is just sometimes, at Feeding America, we've got to remind ourselves, it's like we're not just about addressing hunger. We need to listen to all the issues that impact our Native and tribal communities. So hunger is sometimes related to education or lack of employment opportunities yeah. or uh, um, you know, public safety or health. So it's, hunger is just one spoke on a wheel of all things that are related to Native people and to all communities of color. But um, uh, I was just wondering if you saw any of that yourself in, in um, you know, funding is being now given to tribes. Is it being utilized to really support all the initiatives that you see going on that are needed? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think there have been some creative opportunities um, through USDA recently uh, that have actually prioritized working with tribal governments to buy food directly from native producers, for example, which is always a really powerful way to support uh, tribal communities and food security writ large, because you're right, it is a system. And supporting tribal producers means that those folks have a guaranteed market for their products. They may be able to get an additional line of credit uh, and buy uh, a new uh, piece of equipment that they really needed to be able to add more value to their operation. They make more money. Maybe they can hire some employees. So they're employing folks within the government or within their community. Um, and that's how you know long term you stabilize food systems. It's not just um, food assistance programs. It's also looking at those economic opportunities too. And I think that some of the, uh, that funding that was able to come through some of the pandemic relief legislation enables tribal governments to make those investments because tribal governments know their own communities best. Um, so we saw, you know, tribal governments, I think, uh, investing in their own tribal departments of agriculture, building those over the last couple of years. I can't tell you how many calls our office has gotten um, about tribes that are really interested in, in building that really strong legal foundation for that work that they're doing. And those departments often are working with uh, many other uh, departments within a tribe because it's not just about the food. It's also about uh, social services access, healthcare access. Uh, it's about infrastructure, water, sewer, internet, all of those things. And so I think, you know, when you empower tribal governments and provide those resources, um, good things happen. So definitely. Thank you. Um, you mentioned some of the members of the Native American Farm Bill Coalition. Um, could you describe? Well, share a little bit who they are and what the kind of works they do that's different from what you do and how you all kind of came together and started this yeah. coalition. Um, we go back to 2017 um, and the Shakopee, Midwakan and Sioux community uh, came and invested initially in the Native Farm Bill Coalition and really helped to get everything started by commissioning a report from our office. Uh, we like to call ourselves the back office nerds for the Farm Bill Coalition. Uh, we're like a policy wonks and attorneys. No one would ever accuse me of being a wonk, right? You've gotten that in the last like 10 minutes that I've been sitting here. Um, but we are, we're the people who do the, that back office research work. But then there are incredible advocacy forward organizations and native producer forward organizations um, that are also really critical members of the coalition. So when uh, Shakopee commissioned the report that we did, we worked with the Intertribal Agriculture Council and the National Congress of American Indians as well to put together the Native Farm Bill Coalition. Um, NCAI uh, is a a huge organization. It's been around for a very long time uh, in Indian country. They're based in DC. Uh, they don't just cover food and agriculture. They look across all of the federal portfolio and uh, look at opportunities for Indian country in all of those places. Um, there's also, and they do a lot of, of advocacy in that regard. There's also, and the Intertribal Agriculture Council is a native producer supporting organization. They turned 35 this year. Uh, so they've been around for a long time. Um, they actually have a vast technical assistance network of native producers who work for them that are on the ground all over Indian country. They work one-on-one -on -one with native farmers, ranchers, food producers. They help them try to access USDA programs that make uh, their operations successful, that help them feed communities, helping them access new loan programs, new grant programs as those opportunities come around. And that producer touch point that they have is so critical when you're working on policy um, because you can't make good policy unless you are listening and 
working with community. Um, that's, that's the heartbeat of the Native Farmville Coalition, is the Native producers and tribal citizens and tribal leaders um, who are out every day uh, making policy and working in community and feeding their communities. So I think it, all of our powers combined, I guess, uh, makes a good team for the Native Farmville Coalition. Great, thank you. I, I would like to open the conversation up to those who are here. Uh, I don't know if people online can send messages or not, but uh, definitely if anyone has any questions, uh, we would love to just, or if you know of initiatives or your own experiences of um, uh, how the pandemic impacted our tribes or things that you've heard, um, we would love to have any questions or input that you all have. Hello. Ooh. Thank you so much for this. Um, I have a question about specifically you're at the University of Arkansas, right? We are. And so even though the coalition sounds like it extends well beyond this, you know, kind of region of where we're standing, can you, you tell me a little bit more of how that ended up at the University of Arkansas and like the sort of role, is this one of many kinds of uh, initiatives that live at other universities? I mean, I'm just kind of curious, like, wow, this is cool. It's right here. So yeah, that's, that's a great cool. question. We, we get that question a lot, actually. Oh, is like, okay. why, are, why are you in Arkansas? Um, we, we're here. Um, the initiative is here at the University of Arkansas School of Law because of two amazing indigenous attorneys uh, who started the initiative 10 years ago. Um, we uh, were founded jointly by uh, Stacey Leeds, who is a citizen of Cherokee Nation and an internationally recognized scholar of tribal governance and just all around incredible human being. Um, and Janie Sims Hip, who's a citizen of Chickasaw Nation, who's currently serving as the first indigenous woman to hold the role of USDA's general counsel. Um, Stacy at the time was the only native dean of a law school in the whole country uh, when she joined the University of Arkansas faculty as dean. Um, and the university, you know, we're a land grant, right? Um, which means we have land that uh, was from land sessions and takings from tribal lands and we sit on and we're supposed to be serving an agricultural purpose. That's part of a, a land grant university's mission. Um, and so we have at the law school as part of that, the oldest uh, food and agriculture master's uh, program in the country. Um, Janie's a graduate of that program, I am as well. And so I think when Stacey came on as Dean, there was this really incredible opportunity to take that expertise that she had in tribal governance and this longstanding expertise of the law school in agricultural policy, marry those two things together and create an organization that focused on indigenous food and agriculture policy, the law of tribal nations and the law of the federal government as it impacts tribal nations. Um, so that's how we came to be at Arkansas. So we're kind of unique uh, where we live in a little pocket universe, kind of all our own at the university um, because we don't really just work in Arkansas, we work all over the country because there are tribal nations all over the country. So our, our work is everywhere. Um, but that, that's kind of how we came to be and, and why we're there. So great question, thank you. Great, any other questions? Um, you mentioned during um, listening sessions you'd been doing that people were talking about barriers that they had for um, applying to like USDA grants and programs that would like benefit farmers starting out. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, how, how much time do we have because of how deep in the weeds do you want to get? <laughs> Um, there, there's a lot and they range, they vary from program to program. Um, sometimes it's as simple as, um, you know, the, the broadband challenges. So if you're, if, for example, like a lot of things shifted online on um, the last several years, which makes sense, right? Because people couldn't necessarily get to a USDA office. If people were social distancing, things moved online. Broadband service in Indian country is not as good as it is in other places in the country. Uh, Indian country is left out of a lot of really quality broadband service. So just being able to access an application practically may be difficult. Um, but then you get into situations as well where um, because of the unique legal status of tribal governments and the legal character of lands that Native people produce on, um, USDA applications don't always understand or contemplate that. And so it's kind of like putting a, 
a square peg into a round hole sometimes. And that also can impact native producer eligibility. Uh, and you can't really argue with a form, right? Like, I mean, I try um, <laughs> because I'm an attorney and I can't help myself. Um, but when you're filling out a, you know, you're filling out your uh, application for an, an FSA program or you, maybe you want crop insurance because you want to make sure that your operation is covered if there's a natural disaster. If you're a native producer, you may not have the same kind of balance sheet um, that an, another producer who's not native, not on tribal land would have because your grazing permit may be part of something that your your tribe has worked with you on but it's not it's not the same as a non-native producer would have and so like you don't have your land necessarily but your family's been there for like seven generations and you're not going anywhere but you can't put that on the form the form doesn't think about that and so a lot of those things are things I think we can change um, through through better policy that's actually inclusive upfront about indigenous voices yeah that's a great question I know that you know, for, for Native people that live on reservations, which is allotted land um, given by the federal government entrusted to the tribe, that it's hard, it's been hard for many people to start their own business because there's no collateral. They don't own the land they live on. And so to try to get a loan, and so I know the, the Farm Bill has been trying to address some of those issues. Um, and, and even like if you do have, let's say, a small farm or a ranch, and you want to grow that, the bureaucracy it takes to acquire more land to grow and expand your farm or ranch is very difficult. Yeah. So there's a lot of those things that people don't realize that happen in Indian country with tribes um, that are make it more difficult for them to be successful as entrepreneurs yeah. and as, as farmers and ranchers. So um, some places like where I'm at in Arizona, the Navajo Nation and the Hopi tribe um, their water, because they're, they're in the desert, the water they have, a lot of it's polluted by uranium and copper mining that has taken place on those lands. So even if they do have the land and the ability to produce, just accessing clean, healthy water is difficult to do. So there's a lot of issues like that exist in, you know, with our tribal people that make it difficult to be successful and to be food sovereign. So. But yeah, great question. Anybody else? I think we just have a couple more minutes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Dan Wildcat, Haskell Indian Nations University. Ha have you worked with any tribal colleges? You know, the tribal colleges are all in 1994, granted land grant status. And uh, we're just trying to get our legs under our extension program, but it sounds to me like the areas that you are focusing on and that interesting nexus between the federal government and tribal governments and policies and how difficult that is to sort out, I think there'd be some real opportunities to partnering with some of the TCUs. So. We'd love to partner. No, yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'd actually love to talk to you after this uh, because that's one of the things that we'd really like to do as we grow our work um, is more intentional partnership directly with TCUs. Uh, we have worked um, in a policy space with like AHEC before. Um, yeah, and uh, they, I know, were really instrumental in for, in the Farm Bill, for example, in finally opening up um, some more opportunities for 1994s, like the forestry funding, McIntyre Stennis funding, uh, just for everybody else. Uh, that supports uh, training the next generation of foresters. Uh, there's so many tribal nations that have deep ties to forest land, want to train the next generation of tribal foresters, but the 1994 tribal colleges and universities were not eligible for this huge pot of funding that does that until the 2018 Farm Bill. So that's just one example, but there are the uh, federally recognized tribal extension program that 1994s are now eligible for, um, and I have talked with uh, the AHEC folks I know before about trying to make sure that there's additional funding opportunities for that because it's really, it's underfunded right now and that would be a huge help um, to growing extension services that are actually serving native producers. So let's, yeah, let's chat. Thank you for that. Erin, you used an acronym. Oh no, uh, AHEC, the American <laughs> Indian Higher Education Consortium. Thank you. Sure thing. <laughs> it's keeping me honest. <laughs> I would like to share, I, I got to uh, meet the, uh, someone from the Onondaga Nation um, they're out in central New York, um, and they're one of those tribes, they don't even call themselves a tribe, they're a native nation. Um, 
They're part of the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, the Iroquois, what we call the United States Iroquois Confederacy. Um, they have the most advanced food sovereign program that I know of. Uh, I'm sure there's others that have wonderful programs. I know there's others that do, but I just want to share what I learned from them is that they have no relationship with the federal government. They do not accept federal dollars. Uh, they, do not, they do not have any federal food programs. But they have enough food stored for their tribal members, their native nation members, um, for four years. All their farming uh, is done in a traditional way and uh, where they don't use tractors or fencing or irrigation, they do it the way their ancestors did it. Uh, they also have a seed vault of corn and beans and squash. Um, I think they have like 1,200 or 1,300 varieties of corn in the seed vault, 800 varieties of beans. And these are some corn and beans from tribes that no longer exist. They have Anasazi beans and corn stored. And they grow these on behalf of the, some of the nations and the tribes that they, they, um, they work with so that those beans will always, those seeds will always be recycled or re replenished. Um, so a wonderful food program. And, um, uh, and I think partly because they don't want anything to do with the federal government. So that's probably why they've been successful. Um, but there are some great initiatives like that. And Aaron, I don't know if you know of any uh, other nations that have great programs that are really working for their tribal members? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are there are quite a few um, examples that we could point to ways that tribes are using policy in innovative ways. Um, I know, like the uh, Menominee and Oneida Nations right now have actually come together. They have an intertribal cooperative proposal where they are uh, buying food from each other's tribes to support food security for both of their tribes, for example. Uh, Menominee's been working really hard to stand up their own tribal department of agriculture that also encompasses some of, I mentioned forestry. Um, like you can see the Menominee Forest from space. That's how well managed they are. NASA used to use them to navigate like when they're way up there, wild, right? Um, and I, mean, I think that's just one example. I mean, there are, oh man, I mean, so many cool things that are happening in Indian country food and ag right now. I, I know the, uh, I think a couple of years ago, the Nez Perce tribe passed uh, as part of their tribal uh, law. Anybody who works for the tribal government uh, has time built into their day that they can set aside uh, to go do any kind of traditional gathering um, for traditional foods, for example, like those kinds of policies actually built in for government employees. I mean, it's those are the kinds of things that tribal governments think to prioritize, right? That's not something you'd get from a federal program because it's not the way a federal government would think, but it's the way a tribal government would think. Um, so I, I automatically go to the policy space, but I just I remember thinking about that. I, I, that's, that's such a, a, a cool, innovative, forward-thinking um, thing to make sure that that benefit is in place for tribal citizens. So, I mean, we'd be here all day, I think, probably, if I started listing things. That's true. That's true. You know, one of the really cool experiences I had, I lived in South Dakota for four years and worked with the, the tribes um, uh, in that state. And the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota grouping of tribes uh, that are there, they have really embraced uh, agriculture and new forms of food sovereignty and agriculture because they were people who weren't traditionally um, farmer ranchers. They were not agriculturalists. They were um, hunter-gatherer, foragers, uh, they would follow the buffalo herds. And so uh, being on a, forced onto reservations, they had to learn how to you know, grow their own food. So they've embraced having gardens and community gardens and, and farmers markets and you know, new styles of um, growing food using hay bales or tunnel gardening or um, hydroponics and all those kind of things. So um, they've really embraced agriculture. So it's so exciting to see a tribe where in the Southwest where I'm from, those tribes have planted in traditional ways, the, the Navajo and the Hopi, their corn in a certain place at a certain time. There's so many rituals around that. Um, it's, it's difficult for them to adapt uh, to new types of technology that are out there because they're traditionalists uh, and rightly so. But anyway, there's exciting energy going around in Indian country about food sovereignty. Uh, I did get a question online. Great. 
Um, and I guess it's to me. So what does Feeding America do to support tribal indigenous food sovereignty? And that's an excellent question. Um, so part of my role, I'm a brand new uh, position at Feeding America. I'm the first in this role as the director of native and tribal partnerships. And what we are doing to support um, uh, native American food sovereignty is uh, the way we operate is our food banks partner with the tribes. And so a number of our food banks, including the one in Wisconsin, or the ones in Wisconsin, uh, are partnering with the tribes there. They're purchasing food from our indigenous ranchers and farmers, and then supplying their food boxes that go to tribal communities with that food. So one of the tribes there has a uh, fish hatchery. So they purchase the food and have it frozen or you know uh, sealed up. Um, and given to tribal members. They have, buy corn, there's beef, there's bison meat, there's a number of things they buy. So what it is, it's investing in our indigenous food uh, producers, but then also using that food to feed our native people who are hungry coming from those tribes. Um, so it's a way that we support food sovereignty in that way. Uh, we also are purchasing f food from larger food producers. So. The Navajo Nation has probably the largest food production company um, in the United States. Um, it's called the Navajo Agricultural Product Industry, NAPI for short. Um, and we purchase um, thousands and thousands of pounds of food. A lot of their food is organic. So they grow watermelon and pumpkin and squash and potatoes, um, lots of things like that. They also have their own flour mill and uh, they do blue corn flour, which is specific to some of the tribes in the Southwest, uh, including the Pueblo tribes, Navajo and Hopi. Um, they also produce regular white flour too that's used for you know, a fry bread. Um, so we are purposely sourcing uh, those food producers who are indigenous who can do small quantities or large quantities. Uh, one of the things I've been able to do is supply a couple of grants to help our indigenous food producers to expand their farming or ranching so they can produce um, more supplies that we could purchase from, from them. So those are some ways that we're looking at supporting. I'm also sponsoring um, programs like this, like the cultural celebration, uh, uh, you know, also the indigenous, uh, uh, the Native American uh, food sovereignty program that was held in Michigan uh, this summer. Uh, so sponsoring some of those events to support our indigenous farmers and ranchers uh, is important for us to do as well. So good question. Thank you. Erin, did you want to add anything uh, about? I, I, I love hearing about the indigenous food products that you're sourcing. That's something that we work on a lot at our office on the federal side of things, um, increasing opportunities for native producers to actually be able to sell into programs like the food distribution program on Indian reservations, FDIPR, or as a lot of folks know in Indian country, commods. Um, there are traditional and culturally appropriate foods in that food package uh, because of some really long-standing advocacy by tribal leaders who demanded that those foods be in there because they weren't historically. That's not how the program was designed to work initially. Um, but because of some policy changes, there are some opportunities right now where tribes are doing just that. They're actually, um, like there's a, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium is purchasing, uh, I think, uh, Alaska and halibut and uh, cod for their program uh, that are traditional foods for their program. Uh, there are uh, tribes in the, the Great Lakes region that are pr procuring wild rice from native producers. They've got white fish and uh, lake trout and uh, all of the foods that are actually foods that they've had relationships with um, for thousands of years instead of, um, you know, really good food that's somebody else's traditional food. Like that makes a huge difference. Um, and so seeing those kinds of opportunities come in and hearing about that work is always really exciting for me because I know what that means for uh, communities and also what it means for those producers long term um, economically. So great. You know, one of the things I didn't know about when I came to Feeding America is I didn't know all the federal food programs that existed. Could you share uh, some, some of those that, of um, that are important to, especially in Indian country? Sure. Because uh, we use a lot of acronyms like FDIPR and TFAP and SNAP. And 
So um, if you could share with the people here a little bit about some of those programs, because I didn't know about them all. Yeah. Um, so there, there are a lot of food assistance programs that the federal government offers, but the ones that we work on most often are the 15 food assistance programs that are offered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And within those 15 programs, don't worry, I'm not going to spit 15 acronyms at you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to narrow the list down. Um, because there are some that uh, are, I think, more critical to the food security safety net in Indian country and for tribal citizens than others. One of those is unquestionably SNAP. Uh, that's the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It used to be called Food Stamps. Um, SNAP, we know even before the pandemic, uh, there were at least 25% of all American Indian and Alaska Native people in the U.S. relied on SNAP every month. And that was before the pandemic impacted food security and exacerbated food insecurity for tribal citizens. So SNAP is a huge one. Um, that program, uh, I, I like to call it, a, it's like a means-based program food assistance program, you get the means by which to get food. So if you're uh, participating in SNAP, uh, like when my family was on what you, it used to be food stamps, like you got actual stamps. They've changed in the last 10 years or so. Now it's an EBT card that people get that automatically reloads. Um, and you can take that to a grocery store or a SNAP vendor. A lot of SNAP vendors are actually convenience stores. And then you buy, you buy food without those funds. And that's how SNAP works. Um, FDIPR, on the other hand, which I just mentioned, a commodities program, uh, that, that program is a, a package-based program, more like what Mark's describing with TFAP, where folks get a box of food every month. Um, and I think that's another really critical piece of the food security safety net in Indian country. We know before the pandemic, it was serving about 90,000 people every single month. And of all the 15 programs at USDA that provide food assistance, FDIPR is the only one that serves primarily tribal citizens um, because it is designed uh, to serve in, uh, people on reservations. Uh, and that's what the program was in initially intended to do. So policy changes in that program that have opened up things like fresh fruits and vegetables finally being included in the program, um, more traditional and native produced foods in the food box has been really, really significant because that program serves a high percentage of both native elders and young people. It's about, I think, two thirds of uh, households that are using FDIPR have um, somebody under the age of 18 in the home and about 40% have an elder in the home. So those folks who really need uh, good nutrition because they are more vulnerable to nutrition-related disorders. Like, it's really, really critical that, that we've had that tribal leadership um, pushing for better food in, the, in those programs specifically. But I think those are the big, the big two. I told you I wasn't going to do 15. Um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and, and how are those? Are, are those based upon people's income and number of households? Because I know one of the issues is that a lot of Native people on reservations, you may have 20 people living in a two-bedroom trailer house and if you get one box of food, that doesn't go very far. So maybe right. if you... Uh, yeah, sure. yeah. So the the requirements are a little different for each program, um, but household size is taken to, into account. Um, and so if you if you are in a situation where uh, you're head of household and there are, um, it's multi generational. You may have twenty people in the home. Like your uh, com contents of your package each month are scaled, um, but it is income based, um, just like SNAP is as well. Um, but the way that the calculations run for each program are a little different. We don't have to get into probably uh, those that level of detail, but that's a little bit of how that works. Could you maybe just tell us a little bit the timeline? If the Farm Bill of 2023 goes through, how do things, how is, it, how is that process, and when will it be, if it's voted on, and how, when does it when is it enacted? Or? Sure. Um, so we're, we are really hopeful that we get a farm bill next year. Um, and uh, what that would that would look like, I mean, last time we didn't get a farm bill till December. Technically, Congress has until the end of September 2023 to pass one on time. If they don't pass one on time, they're going to have to do what's called a continuing resolution, which you've probably heard of because Congress does a lot of continuing resolutions lately. Um, it essentially is a pause button. Uh, it'll extend the life of of the Farm Bill and all the programs that are in it um, for the time that's 
included in the resolution. It's usually about, it'd probably be about three months. That's what happened last time in 2018. We had to get a continuing resolution, or if you hear policy people like me talk, we'll just say CR, that's what we mean. Um, and so the Farm Bill in 2018 had a CR, and then the actual new one was signed in December. Um, so I think it's hard to predict what Congress will do, and we're a couple months out from midterms. So once midterm elections happen on November 8th, uh, I think the timeline will look a lot clearer to folks uh, who, who do policy work. Um, I mean, our fingers are crossed that we get one on time. In all likelihood, we'll probably get another CR. Um, if we get one next year, it'll probably be later in the year. That's my, my best guess. Um, I'm not putting any money on the table or taking any bets, but that, that's my guess, is that it would be signed probably much later in the year. And then that gives USDA, uh, they get to work immediately, or they should, um, starting to implement programs and put new things into place. But sometimes it just depends on the program. You also have to wait on Congress to put more money down because not everything gets money in the Farm Bill. So sometimes that delays the process a little bit. But by and large, I would look into next year. Yeah, and Shay, my apologies for missing the first half of the presentation, but I was curious, in your work um, with food sovereignty, one of the biggest challenges, at least I've seen in Oklahoma and some other states, and perhaps even in New Mexico, um, is uh, contaminated land. So has there been any experiences you've had where you've used maybe like a phytoremediation or bioremediation as kind of like a food crop? Yeah, I think, I think that... Um not as a food crop. Um, I'm more familiar with um, like folks like I know Quapa who've done extensive remediation on some of their Superfund sites um, using cover crops as part of uh, like stewardship, uh, but it's not a food crop specifically. Um, there's definitely though, I think places in the farm bill that would support um, more of that, particularly in the conservation title. Um, the, a lot of the NRCS programs I think uh, could be massaged a little bit to help more uh, tribal producers gain access to those. And that's certainly something that we worked on. So um, I know this is this seems like a punt on your question. It's a very good question. I just know, I let, let's talk after this. Because um, I, I think that there's, um, there's a lot that could be done, particularly in that area, for sure. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, Aaron, thank you for your yeah. wisdom and knowledge and your work uh, in Indian country to support our uh, food sovereignty initiatives, our ranchers and farmers, and for so thank you and your team. Oh, thank you. Let's for give her a big hand, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mark.